I want to revisit the topic of this personal, the personal relationship with Jesus that I keep hearing about. People keep talking about we need to have a personal relationship with our Lord and, you know, to get real chummy with Jesus, our good buddy. Um, or sometimes people call him the man upstairs, you know, things like this that are entirely actually not appropriate. That's not the way to approach our Lord, our Savior, the King. Um, but I keep hearing that we are supposed to have this kind of personal relationship with him. And um, we looked, the last time we addressed this topic, we looked at what Jesus had said in John 6 as the controlling um, the controlling passage, John 6, verses 44 through 46, and in which he talked about the Father drawing people to him, and they do so through the word that is spoken. And he makes it rather clear, especially in the 46th verse of John 6, where he says, not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God, he has seen the Father. Referring, of course, to himself. So we don't have a personal you know, knowledge of the Father. The Son has a personal knowledge of the Father. Um, we also looked at Jesus' teaching on personal relationships um, in a number of different places, but um, I think that to remind us, we would look at Luke 8, verses 19 to 21, if you want the reminder, that the Lord as a rule, is going to say that, well, family comes at least second, uh, that fidelity to God is first. The, the, the relationship with our family and with our friends is, is secondary uh, to being right with God and choosing what is good and what is uh, spiritual. And in Luke 8 is where his mother and his brother's were standing outside while he was teaching inside, and they tried to summon him, and that didn't work out too well in the 19th through the 21st verses, where Jesus' reply is, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. So his establishment of a different kind of family is along the spiritual lines. We'll just say that. I think that maybe, in fact, you know, observation tells me that a personal relationship might actually make it harder to prioritize the truth. You know, if I look at, and if we together, you know, you can observe this too. If you look at how lines of fellowship in the churches are drawn and how people are selected to teach, to be elders, to hold gospel meetings, whatever it is, there is a very clear pattern of family relationships and friendships. And um, very often when somebody teaches error and uh, you look into it, you'll find that they either they have a family member who is engaged in some sin and this error is arising from a desire to justify them or, you know, we go along with that because, well, we have family members in the congregation where he teaches, and we don't want to have to make any kinds of distinctions or have to do anything about the error there, right? There's a lot of temptation to do that. I think observation tells me that, if anything, those kinds of relationships are an additional uh, thing that Satan leverages against us. But I thought um, in this the second um I guess the second look at the topic, we looked last time at his family members, <coughs> but I wanted to look at, um, I'm sorry, we looked last time at what he taught, excuse me, about family. This time I want to look at the family members and the friends who literally had personal relationships with him just to see what they're doing and how that, um, you know, what place that relationship holds in the big picture. And we'll start with James, um, who is a brother of the Lord, and the first reference is in Matthew 13, the Gospel of Matthew, the 13th chapter. Jesus had brothers and sisters. Matthew is the 
Jewish perspective, the Jewish account, and they are fairly clear about his lineage and about his, uh, you know, his family tree. That was one of the things they kept very close tabs on. Um, so he, you know, in Matthew 13, it's 54 through 57, Jesus coming to his hometown taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother named Mary? Aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simeon, and, or Simon and Judas? Aren't all his sisters here with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and in his own household. And that 57th verse really belongs with the first lesson that we talked about. You know, these personal relationships may well be a problem. This prophet, Jesus, who is worthy of honor, doesn't have it in his own hometown and doesn't have it among his own kin. But what we're looking at is, who are these people? Well, uh, Jesus' immediate family members are these. You know, the, the father is Joseph. The mother is Mary in the 55th verse. And he has brothers whose names are given. The sisters' names are not given, but the brothers' names are given. James, Joseph, Simon, Judas. which is um, this word translated James is actually Jacob. Um, it's always translated James when it's translated into English. I'm not really 100% sure why. I probably should be. But anyway, that's actually Jacob in the original text there. So just so you know, that's... Um, True, everywhere in the New Testament you read James, it's actually Jacob. That's also why, you know, King James's England is sometimes called Jacobian, because uh, Jacob James. That's also why in Spanish class they'll tell you that the translation of James is Santiago, because that's Saint Yaakov, Saint Jacob. <laughs> uh, for what it's worth, I hope that that helps you remember that James is actually Jacob. And Simon is actually Simeon. And Judas is actually Judah. So this is actually a very um, Jewish family here. We have Jacob, Joseph, Simeon, and Judah following Jesus, whose name is actually Joshua. Joshua is the first, and then Jacob, Joseph, Simeon, Judah, I know it doesn't get any more Jewish than these people are. And Mary's name, again, is Miriam, actually. We, we go with Mary through Greek, through Roman, or Latin, rather, but it's actually Miriam. Anyway, James is the oldest brother next to Jesus. He's the next of kin. In case something happens to Jesus, he takes on the responsibility of the firstborn because he's the second son. That's the idea. It's the next of kin. Um, these are named, and they're named in order. So just to establish that he did have brothers, I realize that a lot of people in the world believe that, that uh, Mary remained a virgin for the rest of her life, did not have any other children, only Jesus, and never had any normal relations with Joseph, but that's not what the Bible shows. It shows clearly that Jesus went, or that Mary and Joseph went on to have a normal married life, have a normal family, of, you know, more children beyond the firstborn. We accept, of course, that the Holy Spirit is what conceived Jesus in the womb of Mary and that she was a virgin at the time of his birth and fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah. But he did go on to have a normal family. So this is biblical in its account. That's what the Bible says about this matter, religions of men notwithstanding. All right, about James. We find in John 7 something about him and about the other brother that we'll talk about. As far as we can tell, None of his brothers actually believed in him. 
while he was walking the earth. John 7 records in the third through the sixth verses, his brothers said to him, leave here, go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you're doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, my time hasn't come yet, but your time is always here. So at first, James and uh, yeah, James and Joseph, Simon and Judah, or Jude, didn't believe in Jesus. While he was on the earth, they didn't accept him. And they're saying to him, yeah, if you want to be known, you go on ahead. And you could see how they were standing outside with mom instead of inside listening to his teaching. And how, um, you know, he said, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own hometown and among his own relatives. So very clear record that at first, anyway, the, the brothers did not believe in Jesus. They, while he walked the earth, they didn't believe what he was saying. They saw him as their big brother. I suppose they thought, you know, they, they must have thought he was more, they must have thought less of him than is typical of brothers <laughs> to think of their older brother, of their big brother. They must have thought less of him than that. They must have thought he was crazy or something. But they didn't believe at that time. That's the record. At the end of the Gospel of John, there is another indication that James and the other brothers are not in line. They're still not spiritual. They're still not believing. When Jesus is dying on the cross, John records in his 19th chapter, the 26th and 27th verses, that Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby. And he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. This statement of Jesus in the 26th verse, Woman, behold your son, corresponds, by the way, to John chapter 2 in the wedding of Cana. When his mother urges him on and he says, woman, what is there between you and me? So immediately there's a separation there. And you see from that point forward, she's not listening to his teaching. She's outside looking for him. And here again, he dresses her, woman, behold your son. So he's leaving. He knows he's leaving. But still, as the firstborn son, it is his responsibility to care for his mother in her old age. It appears at this time that Joseph, the dad, not junior, would be out of the picture. He perhaps has passed away. We don't know what happened to him. But it would have been Jesus' turn or Jesus' responsibility to take care of him. And in the event that Jesus would die... It would have fallen to the next of kin, which would be James, the second-born son. But he, if he was present, he was passed over. It doesn't say he was present at the crucifixion, but if he was, he was passed over in favor of a disciple whom Jesus loved. So James lost custody of his mother to somebody who had faith, somebody who believed, because it appears that, you know, following John 7, 5, that his brother didn't believe in him still at this point in time. And there are some things that are more important than blood, as Jesus said already in the lesson that we looked at last time on this. But... When you get over to Acts in chapter 1, in the intervening time, something has changed, which has to be what was recorded in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, that Christ appeared in the flesh after his death and resurrection. He appeared not just to the uh, disciples and all the apostles, he appeared to James. It doesn't make sense 
to say James, the brother of John, is the James of 1 Corinthians 15, 7, you know, because he would have been numbered among the apostles. This would have made no sense, any more sense than to call it out as some specific thing for any of the other 12 apostles. Somebody will say, well, Peter's pointed out, that's right, because he literally <laughs> had his own particular event there as recorded in the end of the Gospels. But this uh, is to say that Jesus appeared to his brother after his resurrection. Something has happened so that when you get to Acts chapter 1, the record stands in the 13th and 14th verses that they were staying together in an upper room, Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. Again, James, son of Alphaeus, Judas, son of James. These are not James, the brother of Jesus, and Judas, the brother of Jesus. These are other apostles. But the 14th says, All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Which of his brothers, we don't know. Um, but definitely includes brothers. Uh, Greek here is, is like Spanish, and that the collective verb, or the collective noun, excuse me, will, include, will be expressed in the masculine if there is any man in the group, even if it includes women. So this is his siblings, really. But at least one brother is there. They're with one accord. They're gathered. The apostles, the women who went about supporting them, providing, you know, the, the food, the place to stay, the things that they were doing to care for him and the others as they were doing the work of preaching the gospel. And then specifically called out the Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. His family is there too, those who believe at least. If not all his brothers and sisters believe, at least those who do are gathered here. It has to be the Lord's brother, distinguished from the apostle, as we said before. So somewhere between the crucifixion and the time of Pentecost approaching, 50 days later, James came to believe. James continued to believe, if you look at Acts 12. we make a note in Acts 12 together with Acts 15. In Acts 12, at verse 2, it's recorded that Herod, the king, killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. That's the apostle that we referred to earlier who was already accounted for and the reason why it wouldn't make sense to call him out separately in 1 Corinthians 15, he must be, Paul must have been talking about James, the brother of the Lord. And that would make sense, that if the risen Lord appeared to his brother, and his brother, you know, the second born, would have grown up right close to him in age, would have known him quite well, and realized, yeah, that's him. Yeah, he's, he's resurrected. That would have made an impression. That makes perfect sense why he would have come to believe and he would have been among the number in Acts chapter 1. But in Acts 12, 2, the, the other James, the brother of John, was killed. But you find in Acts 15, in verse 3, that there is a James there who speaks up at that time. I'm sorry, verse 13. Acts 15, verse 13. First Peter spoke, then Paul and the others spoke, who had been teaching among the nations, and then in the 13th verse, after they finished speaking, James began to speak. It's not James the brother of John, That's, that apostle is gone, there's no more ambiguity about what James this is, it has to be the Lord's brother. So he stayed in Jerusalem, he was there. In Judea, where the, the rest had scattered, been scattered, the rest of the church had been scattered, but the apostles stayed there. Well, the Lord's brother stayed there too, apparently. And he's also the James, therefore, 
of Galatians 2, who sent certain Jewish men to Peter. So he fell prey to that hypocrisy that took Peter and James and maybe some of the others, and Barnabas, the son of encouragement. So this is, I guess, a bit of a commentary on that event that you can see the great power of Peter being overtaken with this thing. Peter, whom they call Cephas, which, by the way, is... Um, is, is a Greek nickname that's indicating the head or the chief. Um, to have the Lord's brother and to have Peter overtaken in this sin of treating the Jews differently from the Greeks, treating the Greeks as second-class citizens, you see the power of that. So that's unfortunate that he fell according to that example. But, you know, as for that topic, you can see the end of 2 Peter, how he is thankful for Paul's writings and calls him beloved. And I think that they both realized that was wrong what they did and were glad that somebody stood up and spoke the truth. But that's a brother of the Lord. He didn't believe while Jesus was alive. He believed for a time. He wrote, or he caused... Uh, the words are, he was the, the one through whom the Holy Spirit spoke in Acts 15, a number of things that are recorded in Acts 15 for us. Did he write the book of James? We don't know that. I haven't found it. If you find something that's compelling, please let me know. But I did not see anything that made very clear that this, the author of the book of James, is the, the Lord's brother as opposed to James, John's brother. I didn't see anything there that was clearly pointing to one or the other. I would say this, if James, the brother of the Lord, wrote that book, then it's interesting that both the brothers of Jesus we know about wrote books in the New Testament, and Jesus himself wrote nothing. That tells you something. <laughs> he speaks the word and he sends it through messengers, and the word's power is, is binding, though sent through messengers. That's an interesting thing. But I don't know, um, and so I didn't include that here, whether he wrote that or not. If you find something compelling, I'm open to that. Thanks for letting me know if you have it. But this brother of the Lord, you know, didn't believe at first, came to believe had the right doctrine and encouraging words, and the things that he said that were good and right were recorded in Acts 15. And yet we know that he joined with Peter and the rest in a hypocrisy that had to be rebuked in Galatians 2. So what is, what is he? Well, he's just a man. <laughs> he's just a man like any of us. That's it. Sometimes he did right. Sometimes he did wrong. He's not perfect. He's not infallible. He has no more authority than you and I have in the gospel, other than the fact that, of course, he was a witness to the resurrected Jesus. But as far as this doctrine goes, he doesn't have more than you and me. He's just a man. His relationship with the Lord changed when the Lord was ascended into heaven, necessarily so. The other brother is Jude. That's Jude of the New Testament uh, letter. He's the youngest brother. We already looked at Matthew 13, 54 to 57, where they identify his brothers by name, which are James, Joseph, Simon, Judas, which is Jacob, Joseph, Simeon, and Judah, which is also Jude. I do not know why they chose to translate it Jude when it was the letter from Jude. I have no idea why. They are all the same word. Judas, uh, both Judas Iscariot and Judas his brother here in Matthew 13 uh, and any other Judases that might be named is all Judah, as well as Judah, of course. And anywhere that it says Jude, that's also Judah. So the New Testament has three different uh, ways that it translates the Hebrew Judah 
But in the original language, the Greek, they're all Judah. So his name's Judah. That makes perfect sense. But it's also the Jude who wrote that letter. Um, just as we noted with James or Jacob before, he's among the number of those who didn't believe in him at first when he didn't believe in him at first when he was on the earth. John 7, 3 through 6 records this. But he did come to believe by the time the day of Pentecost has come, as Acts 1, 13 to 14 indicates, there his brothers were there with his mother Mary, with the apostles, including some with his same name. But you'll notice in the letter from Jude something very interesting that should be said. I think it's very touching, actually. I think it's very important and very touching what he says, and is probably the best thing from one of these family relationships. It's just the way that he opens this letter. The letter clearly follows 2 Peter. Okay, 2 Peter, when you look at the themes of 2 Peter, what's recorded there, what he said, how he wrote, Jude is clearly writing in retrospect of that letter. It may even be after the death of Peter. And Jude's writing is kind of like us. He's kind of in our position that he's you know, received this letter from Peter as you and I have received this letter from Peter. And he's writing to reaffirm, to remind us, to call us to action, to stand up for that truth. But this Jude or Judah or Judas, the brother of the Lord, says, Judah, a servant of Jesus Christ, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, and brother of James, which is Jacob. I find that to be touching. The other James, who was an apostle, is the brother of John, not of the other apostle named Judas. And the other apostle named Judas, there's no mention of a brother, let alone a brother named James. It's not him. This is Judas, the brother of Jesus. And he says, when he gives his title, who he is, as is the form, when you write a letter in the ancient world, you have to say who you are and identify yourself. When he identifies himself, he says, I'm the brother of James, I am the bondservant of Jesus, the anointed. Jesus is the Christ. He's the Lord's anointed. He's the king. I'm his bondservant, meaning a willing servant, somebody who chooses to be a slave to this master, presents himself to serve this master. I think that's very touching. He doesn't claim his relationship, his personal relationship with Jesus as his brother, even though he's the youngest brother. And that's where things are different. You know, the youngest brother tends to look up to the oldest brother. There tends to be more rivalry between the ones that are closer to each other, but the youngest one tends to look up to the oldest one. But this youngest one didn't hold on to that, you see. He didn't hold on to their personal family relationship. In fact, he demoted himself in humility, saying, I'm the brother of James. I'm the bondservant of Jesus. My oldest brother is not my brother anymore. My oldest brother is the Lord's anointed, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. That's what he's doing. I think that's really something what Jude did there. It tells us, I think, it's probably the best one-verse sermon that there is. <laughs> it tells us exactly how we ought to see this. Though we maybe had, uh, you know, not we, but those in the New Testament who had some personal relationship with Jesus in the past, they didn't hold on to it. And it's what, it's what Paul said. 
In 2 Corinthians 5.16, even though we once knew Christ according to the flesh, we know him thus no longer. The Jew knew him in the flesh, of course, but it's not like that anymore. It's changed. Paul knew him in the flesh in the sense that he was in Jerusalem environs while Jesus was alive and teaching. He saw that. He had to, to be an apostle. Not just the appearance of Christ resurrected afterward on the road to, to Damascus, but he saw Jesus teaching. I mean, he knew it was him. He could verify that was him because he knew he had seen him. But Paul himself said, well, we used to know him in the flesh, but we don't know him that way anymore. It's not like that anymore. Those who knew Jesus before in the flesh, who literally had a personal relationship to him, did not count that a thing to be grasped. To paraphrase the letters, but emptied themselves of that relationship. So I say again, I think that you know, observation shows that the personal relationships are maybe more of a potential attack vector, <laughs> uh, not something that you want to have you know, with Jesus or that you can have with Jesus, but rather as a potential thing that makes it hard for us to stand up to people and to hold, up, hold out the truth. Um, it's not that these relationships, our personal relationships in life, our, our siblings, our mother and father, our, um, our spouses, our children, you know, we're not saying this is not important, nor are we saying that Jesus didn't care about his brothers and his mother and his sisters. That, that's not biblical. Nothing says he had no concern for them. In fact, you see clearly he provided for his mother even while dying on the cross. Uh, what we're saying is that the assertions of people today that we should have a personal relationship with God or with Christ, there's no Bible for that. That's not biblical. It's not possible. We don't know Jesus. We, he's gone from the earth. He hasn't been on the earth in thousands of years. We didn't live here with those who did. You know, his mother was here and gave her testimony to Luke. His brothers were here and wrote at least one letter of the New Testament in addition to some things that are recorded for us through the apostles. The apostles themselves who knew him wrote, the, wrote letters as well. They who had that personal relationship with Jesus, you know, that was possible for them, but even they did not hang on to that they didn't talk about their friendship with him, what he liked to do, what his favorite game was, what his favorite food was. They didn't talk about things like that. Why not? Because their relationship with him changed too. They, like Jude, said, you know, I'm not his brother anymore. I'm his subject. He's the king. Right? They, they abandoned the former relationship the former way in which they knew him in the flesh in order to adopt the spiritual reign of Jesus in their own lives, to accept that, in fact, he is the Christ. He is the one that God chose to be the king. And yes, the reason why we talk about this is because I think, you know, looking for that personal relationship, the personal tie, really is a dangerous thing. It undermines his authority over us as the king. It makes us a little too chummy, a little too buddy-buddy. And though Jesus is merciful, and though he's been tested as you and I have been, and he knows what it is to be us, and we're very thankful for that, it's wonderful. We're still not buddy-buddy, chummy-chummy, you know. That's not the way that our relationship is. He died for us. It was very serious what happened to him, and it's our fault. We have to recognize that he's the king. The way that Jude did, he, he demoted himself, you know. No longer should you talk about me as, as the Lord's brother. I'm the Lord's bondservant, which all of us are. We present ourselves as servants to Christ. 
a master who is the best master that you could possibly have. You think about your great bosses in life, and sometimes you do have great bosses. Sometimes you don't. But sometimes you do have great bosses. But nobody's better than Jesus. <laughs> nobody's got your back like Jesus. Nobody knows what you're going through like Jesus. You know, nobody is fair and just in their treatment of you like Jesus is. He's the best master. If you haven't put Jesus on in baptism for forgiveness of sins, what's holding you back? Those who knew him in the flesh gave up their earthly relationships. So important to them was the spiritual righteousness through the Son of God. You too ought to give up your earthly passions and your earthly ways and, and your allegiances to this world to come into service to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We have water prepared that you might be baptized if that is your need. Are you a Christian who hasn't lived right? Let us pray for you that you might be restored to him. We do have a relationship with God through his Son, Jesus. We have great boldness to enter the throne room of grace through the blood that is inaugurated away into the holiest of holies. It's a grand thing to be a Christian, to be a child of God, to have an avenue of prayer. If you need our prayers, we'll pray with you. If you need to obey the gospel, we'll help you. If you need the prayers of the saints, you need to be baptized. Either way, please let your need in the Spirit be known now by coming together while we stand and sing.